Lord, we want to thank you for Karen. And we would pray for her as she comes to bring the word this morning, that you would anoint her, that you would empower her, that you would give her clarity of mind, and that we would have open hearts to what you would say to us this morning. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. I wonder what pictures come to mind as you listened to this description of heaven from Revelations. In 1999, Bart Millard from the band Mercy Me wrote these words, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Have we ever stopped, really reflected on what it would be like to be in heaven? When standing before the Lamb who was slain, how will we respond? How will we react in the presence of the one who took all of our sin upon his shoulders? When standing before the King of kings and Lord of lords, the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what will we do? What will be our heart response to love? Romans 12.1 says, Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness experiencing all the delights all that delights his heart for this becomes your genuine expression of worship let's pray Lord, my prayer this morning is that everything, not just that we've done before, but everything right now, Lord, points to you. Every word that is spoken points to you, Jesus, the lamb that was slain. As Adam prayed, let's soften our hearts, Lord, I pray. Remove the obstacles in our lives that stop us from discovering you. And Lord, may we be open, open our ears, remove the scales from our eyes and soften our hearts for more of you, Lord God, I pray in your powerful name. Amen. Well, this week, if you haven't picked it up, our Healthy Rhythm series continues as we explore the healthy rhythm of worship. 
There's so much to be explored into the Bible about worship, I'm not even going to guess how long it might take us to fully explore everything Sunday after Sunday that God has said in his word about worship. And not only in addition to God's word, but there's so many, 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 many books written about corporate worship. And I guarantee in this room, every one of us, or at least most of us, or in, online, would have our own view and thoughts of worship. Maybe even at some point you found yourself in a robust discussion around the topic of worship. I would suggest that we all come on a Sunday or to other gathering, corporate gatherings with thoughts about what should happen in our corporate gathering, what we think shouldn't happen, or even what we will or won't get out of it. What worship is, or should be, has been a topic for discussion down through the ages, and I'm sure will never end until Christ comes again. So let's start today at looking at some definitions of worship. The English, English language word for worship comes out of worth-ship. Giving worth to something or someone or expressing value about someone or something. The Greek word, which is most commonly used in the New Testament, proskuneo, to come towards, to kiss, to do reverence to. It's an external act of prostrating oneself with an internal attitude of reverence and humility. The Hebrew word, shakta, that's how it's pronounced, I think, to bow, to stoop, to bow down before someone as an act of submission or reverence, to make oneself low. The Psalms are full of this word of worship. Worship the Lord with reverence, Psalm 211. All the earth will worship thee, Psalm 66, 4. Come, let us worship and bow down, Psalm 95, 6. Worship at his footstool, Psalm 99, 5. Worship at his holy hill, Psalm 99, 9. Nothing in these meanings refer to buildings, forms, rituals, a song, a prayer, a particular time or place. Rather, they talk about putting upon the one who is worthy of worship, the one whom we place value upon, to come before the worthy one with reverence and awe, to be up close and personal with the one who is worthy, worshipping at the worthy one's feet and joining with all creation in worship of the one who is worthy. Who is this worthy one? Well, the Revelations 5 verses that I read out before says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom. Him who lives forever and ever, our eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Mark 12, verse 30, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. See, we are first and foremost commanded to worship God, to have no other gods before the Lord God. And we are to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Sounds simple, doesn't it? How hard is that to do? In Romans 12.1, which I read earlier, Paul points us to worship not being a single act or moment in time, but rather worship being our whole lives, the surrender of ourselves to God, placing him at the very centre of our lives, living in holiness 
This becomes our genuine expression of worship, giving our whole energy and attention to expressing God's worth, setting our thoughts on him. And out of our love for God flows the acts or expressions of worship, bowing, stooping down, moving towards to kiss the hand of God, physically prostrating oneself as an external act, and bowing ourselves internally, our minds and our thoughts and our attitudes with reverence and humility towards our living God. Worship is our life. Worship, God doesn't want a portion of our lives. He wants every part of us, our whole being, our heart. Jesus said exactly this when he met a Samaritan woman at the well late in an afternoon, when he sat beside her, when he connected with her, when he engaged with her, asking her for a drink, then talking about a living water that would never run out. As she sat with Jesus and listened to everything he said, it sparked her curiosity. And with a boldness, she asks a question. Let's pick up the story in John 4, 19 to 26. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that worship is the only place, Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. See, Jesus said to the woman, where worship happens is not the main thing. Form, ritual, ceremony are not the main things. What really matters is the attitude of the heart and mind. Worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This is true worship. In spirit to reflect and be consistent with the very nature of the living God, the worthy one we worship. In truth, to worship with transparency, integrity, truthfulness and sincerity. This is what really matters. In fact, this is what God is looking for. He's seeking this. He is actively looking for those who will worship him with a genuine, real, transparent and sincere heart. A healthy rhythm of worship is heart worship. In the late 1990s, Matt Redman wrote a song after the pastor of his church made some radical changes for a season because his pastor felt the congregation had lost their way in worship. The pastor asked the church family one Sunday, when you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? And it was out of this season in their church that this worship song was birthed. When the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come. 
longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It may be an obvious statement after what we've just done, but the heart of our worship must be Jesus, the Lamb of God. When we worship in the quiet of our home when no one is around, when we are out in creation and we are stirred to worship, whether ministering and serving others out of a worship-filled heart, whether worshipping while doing chores and mundane tasks, when we gather as a community of believers to worship, it must be about Jesus and him alone, nothing else. Glorifying him in everything we do, spending time with him, walking in his presence every minute of the day. When Jesus is at the very core and heart of our worship, there can be only one response from us, and that is to worship from the heart. Our whole being responds with love to our God. Our heart connecting with the heart of Jesus. Our heart being consumed by the heart of Jesus. That's the healthy rhythm of worship. When this healthy rhythm of heart worship penetrates every part of our lives, we can experience the very presence of God, just like God promised to Moses in Exodus 33, 14. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. When our heart is aligned with the heart of God in our day-to-day -day activities, we begin to recognize his voice, sense his loving arms around us, holding us. Know he is with us through the challenging times. As we sit at his feet, we can find joy in his presence, as Psalm 16 verse 11 says. Strongholds can be broken in our lives that set us free when we sit in the presence of God. Then out of this heart-to-heart -heart connection with God, out of an overflowing of our hearts connecting with God, something else happens. It stirs an uncontainable desire to gather with other heart worshippers. A healthy rhythm of worship is also reflected in a healthy rhythm of corporate heart worship. Rick Warren says this, our corporate worship is really an extension of our daily walk with God, where our attitudes and actions already serve to worship our Creator. See, it's a natural thing to do. If our daily lives are surrendered as a genuine expression of worship, in fact, I think an excitement builds for the regular assembly of God's people when we've been walking daily through the week with him. <coughs> the message translation of Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 25 say this. So friends, we can now, without hesitation, Walk right up to God, into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. So let's do it. Full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. 
He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Jesus also said in Matthew 18 verse 20, for where two or three gather together as my followers... I am there among them. This is his promise. Not only can we boldly come to the throne of grace in personal, everyday worship because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, but when we remain committed to gathering with each other in worship, then the promise is the presence of God will be there also. How encouraging is this? It's his promise. He doesn't go back on his promises. He can't. It's not in his nature. That's why we should come to our corporate worship gatherings with an expectancy to meet Jesus because he promises to be here. How amazing is this? The presence of God, the almighty God, is here with us because two or three are gathered in his name. That's amazing. God shows up when his people gather to worship. When the Israelites walked around the walls of Jericho, And the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God went before them and they worshipped God. The walls came down. In 2 Chronicles 5, 13 to 14, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the freshly made temple of God, his presence was there. The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Music made a sound of unity. Musicians and singers sang as one. Their hearts were aligned with the purpose of worshipping their God and the priests couldn't perform their duties. How amazing would that if nothing else happened but we stood in the presence of God because we just couldn't do anything else. The book of Acts is an account of God showing up time and time again when the church gathered together. There are so many examples throughout the Bible of where God's people gathered and he showed up in amazing, miraculous and unexpected ways. I don't know what goes on in your heart, mind and soul as you come to worship on a Sunday or any other times when you gather in life groups or prayer groups or ministries. But for me, as I've grown in my faith, an understanding of God's ways, and I'm certainly not anywhere close to where God desires me to be. But with his grace, I've come to expect God to be there as he promised. My heart is expectant to meet with God, for God to move in my heart and the hearts of those that gather. I expect lives to be changed Because we stand in the presence of God, see him face to face, and are consumed by his life and love. Sometimes we may be tempted to confine our healthy rhythm of worship to a personal heart worship. Thinking, this is enough. I've worshipped God throughout my life and through my days this week. I've served him. You know, that's a lie of the enemy. And I'd say that in itself is not a healthy rhythm. Even Jesus knew the importance of gathering for corporate worship. Luke 4.16 says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He went, as usual, to the synagogue. Public worship was regular for Jesus. 
If the Son of God recognised the importance of a healthy rhythm of worship, gathering with the community of believers, then how much more do we need to make this a healthy rhythm in our lives? And if you didn't pick it up from the Revelations reading, we're going to be doing it for a whole, whole long time in heaven, gathering with all the saints, 10,000 times 10,000, thousands upon thousands, standing, kneeling, bowing, praying, being silent, declaring praises to our God. Our corporate worship will never end. So while we are still on this earth, let's, let's not be complacent about gathering together. For you see, through Christ, our inheritance is is being part of the kingdom, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands. We are sons and daughters of the most holy God, the King of Kings. We are to declare his praises who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light regularly. So we should intentionally commit to gathering as God's people, making corporate worship a non-negotiable in our lives. I don't know about you, but if God promises to show up every time two or more of us gather, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what God still does and is going to do and what he will do as we gather corporately in his presence and in his name. Our healthy rhythm of worship is not just personal heart worship, but is reflected in a healthy rhythm of corporate heart worship. Mentioned last week that some of us were traveling to Sydney this week this last week that's gone, to the Propel Network conference. And one of the speakers at the conference was Dr. Jacqueline Service. She's a lecturer in uh, theology at St. Mark's National Theological Centre. Yes, she's Anglican. On the last day, the topic of her session was the glory of God, her purposing strength and courage. Now, I can in no way come close to articulating the fullness of what she shared. But from my humble understanding and the limited notes I took because I just couldn't type fast enough, I can sum it up in layman's terms like this. When we worship, sit at the feet of Jesus, consumed by the very presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, connect and commune with God who is truth, life, love, hope, and so much more. Our lives can't help but be reorientated towards God. In other words, a healthy rhythm of worship changes us. Heart worship, corporate heart worship, changes us. She even went on to challenge us, and you could almost feel the room go silent. According to my limited notes, and this is not a direct quote because I just couldn't write it fast enough, but she challenged us She said, worship is being aligned to God's way. It exposes our sin. If we are not allowing worship of our God to change us and transform us, then we are just gazing. like the nine-year-old on the soccer field that's focused everywhere else are on the main game. 
2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18 says, But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. Now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit and wherever he is Lord, there is freedom. We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces and with no veil we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another and this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The message translation says the last word like this, verse like this, nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God encounters our lives and we become like him. Standing face to face before the Almighty, confronted with the glory of his presence, his greatness, his unconditional love, his holiness, the whole being of God commands a response. Moses, Jacob, David, Nehemiah, Isaiah, Paul, Peter, Thomas, John, Mary and Martha, the Samaritan woman at the well, in fact, if you read through Hebrews 11, you will discover the great cloud of witnesses who surround us and have gone before who encountered the living God and were changed forever. An exchange occurs. Something almost unexplainable occurs when we sit, stand, kneel, lift our hands, Bow prostrate at the feet of Jesus. Our heart connecting with his heart, his presence consuming us, hearts laid bare before the King of Kings, the Saviour, love, truth, hope, life, the one who gave his all for us so we may have life. When all of this happens, we are transformed. When we come and step into an atmosphere of faith and expectancy in our corporate gatherings, lives are changed. Sin is exposed and a call is heard to serve God. Chains are broken and people are set free. Healing occurs. Joy fills a saddened heart. Strength replaces weariness. Love consumes loneliness. Hope is spoken into hopeless situations. Victory comes, even though defeat seemed inevitable. Eyes are opened. Hearts are softened. I couldn't help but share this picture of one of my beautiful granddaughters. She's actually been held by her father. You can't see him, but she's been held by her father. I don't know what God is doing in her heart at this moment. She's only nearly two when this picture was taken. But by gosh... When we're held by the Father and we gather in corporate worship together, who knows what God does? She's seeing me lift my hands in surrender to God and she says, wow, might as well imitate that. Just on a side note, parents, don't for one moment discount the value of bringing your children into the house of God to worship corporately. You never know what God will do. Make the effort, no matter how hard it is every Sunday, no matter how hard it is to gather them up. You don't really feel like you've got a heart of worship when you're gathering them up from breakfast to get them here. 
gather them up. See, it's a seed being planted in their hearts. That was a side note, not on my notes. See, when we are standing and transformed by the presence of God, we become better people. I don't mean super people. I don't mean super people who just are everywhere doing everything. Because that's not what God's looking for. We become better people out of the heart. Better parents, better children, better husbands, better wives, better leaders, better followers, better employers, better employees, better retirees, better friends, better followers of Jesus, surrendered in every part of our lives to a higher cause, the cause of Christ, because we reflect Christ. Others see us changed. They see something different in us, just like the woman at the well saw something different in Jesus, and it stirred her to ask questions. People will notice the change And it will spark their curiosity. And guess what? Who knows? It might lead to more people knowing real life in Jesus. A healthy rhythm of worship, a heart response to Jesus, the heart of worship, a heart response consumed by the presence of God in the gathering of God's people, Corporate heart worship changes us to be more like Jesus. I know we've got a series about a healthy rhythm. But as I was sitting in um, the motel room before the Propel conference started, I just sort of felt the conviction of God saying, it's not a healthy rhythm. It's... A heart beat. It's a heart beat. A healthy rhythm of worship is a heart beat. What happens if it becomes the heart beat of our lives that we are totally and utterly dependent upon? Because if the heartbeat doesn't happen, what happens? My prayer is that this will become our genuine expression of worship because the Father is actively looking for you to worship him. For your sake. How will you respond when you stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? How will you respond? What needs to change in your life, in my life, in our life for a healthy heartbeat of worship to consume it. Let's pray. I pray, Lord, first of all, that only the the words that of you of you will remain deep in our hearts and our souls and our spirits and our minds right now. That any empty words will just fade away. I pray, Lord, that a fresh stirring will happen in our hearts for you. A fresh hunger for you, Lord God, to worship you in your presence every minute of the day. But not only every minute of the day, but as we come and gather as a corporate body, Lord, the gathering of the assembly of the saints. Lord, that we will encounter you in a fresh and powerful way. Lord, I pray right now you will speak into every individual's hearts, Lord. 
And I pray that we will do business with you. Lord, what is it that needs to change? What is it that needs to change in me so I don't walk out through these doors the same? What is it that needs to change in your presence, Lord God? What is it that needs to be stripped away? I pray, Lord, that as we spend time in your presence, Lord, not just now, but in every moment of our day, that as we do that, Lord God, you will reveal to us more and more of what it means to have a healthy heartbeat of worship for you. Lord, that the very life of your being flows in and through us and out of us. Lord, that others will see the glory on our faces, Lord, that we can't explain. It's just because we spent time with you. And others will be drawn into your presence because they see you. Lord, let your fresh anointing fall. Change us, Lord. Challenge us. And draw us closer to you, Lord God, because we just want to be in your presence. Because that's where we belong. You created us for that. We just want to be here with you.